Welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled you can join us today. If you are new to our show, Alzheimer Speaks was created because of my own mother who lived with dementia for 30 years. I got kind of tired of my voice not being heard and hers not even being considered in part of the conversation. So Alzheimer Speaks is really about connecting people to services, products, and tools all around the world and collaborating with one another, inspiring one another of what is possible when a diagnosis of dementia hits. So maybe, just maybe, you can be our next guest. Um, if you are looking for resources, um, check out alzheimerspeaks.com. We have one whole section that has just a variety of things that, that you can tap into. You will also find our book tab So if you have children who you're trying to explain this to, uh, maybe it's uh, your own children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, um, Betty the Bald Chicken is a great book to open up that conversation and get people talking uh, about about being different and what that feels like and and how we can help one another. Um, I also want to give a shout out to um, Arbor Oak Senior Living and Cedar Creek Senior Living and Andover YMCA on June 10th. I'll be out there. We're going to do a screening of the film, A Timeless Love. And we'll be doing a talk back from, um, what is it, 10 to noon. And if you're interested, you can go and uh, call 763-230-9622 and uh, make your reservation to to be part of that event. It'll be a lot of fun. We are going to be talking today about the magic of music and how do you leverage that in dementia care. And so I'm just really thrilled uh, that we'll be talking with Tara Jenkins, who is a board certified uh, music therapist. She is also a certified dementia practitioner and a Montessori dementia care professional with over 16 years of experience working in the elder care field. She is the co-author of the book, Music, Memories, and Meaning, How to Effectively Use Music to Connect with Aging Loved Ones. And it is fabulous. It is one of the best books I've seen out there regarding this topic. And um, it's something you'll be able to use as a tool and start implementing right away. And she is also the founder of Harmony in Dementia, which provides group and individual music therapy services, music consultation services, and music workshops, and then training for older adults, carers, and professionals. So we are going to have a lot to talk about, and it's going to be an absolutely fabulous conversation. So I am so excited, uh, Tara, to have you on the show today. Um, I know this is going to be a fun conversation, but before we dive into all all the questions I have for you, I always like to ask everyone if they've been personally touched by dementia in their own family or circle of friends. Sure. Uh, Yeah, I had a grandmother who um, lived with uh, dementia and some additional mental mental health diagnoses uh, when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what started my journey. You know, I was fascinated by, you know, when I made a connection with her and why that was the case. And, you know, at that point, I didn't really, I didn't know anything. (laughs) So, you know, it kind of uh, really started my passion as I started to explore this as a career and, you know, exploring music therapy in general, and then moving on. And then of course, you know, all the knowledge that I've gained since um, she was in that nursing home when I was in middle school and high school, you know, now, 
so many things make sense there's so many things you know you make those connections afterwards uh you know it, you know when you when you know more <laughs> uh and that kind of a thing so yeah that's 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 kind of how how it it was connected to me personally that wow so so you've got this personal connection but when you started in you know music therapy and stuff was there something you saw in the field too that said that told you I, I just this is what I want to do full time? Yeah. So when I was in high school, I was in all the things, you know, I was all the extracurricular. So drama, band, you know, and I knew I wanted to pursue music, but I didn't really want to teach. I didn't really want to perform. And that's kind of how I discovered music therapy. And then when I went to school, our first practicum, which are kind of like rotations, you know, we do um different practicums each semester with different groups of folks. And the first one uh, was with older adults. And so it was a group in a nursing home. And for me, that was kind of it. Like I, I clicked with those, those folks and those individuals so much. And I just really felt almost like a calling, you know, I, I really felt that I had this connection with this group of people and you know, I explored lots of other uh, age groups and, and, and different populations and things like that, but I kept coming back to older adults and I kept coming back to dementia. And eventually I did my six month internship at that same nursing home where I had the practicum. Uh, and then I, the rest is kind of history. It's now 16 years later and I'm still working with older adults. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we probably should define what the heck is music therapy because you yeah. said you know, you didn't really want to act and you didn't really want to perform. So what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Doing? So the kind of official definition is it's music therapy is a clinical and evidence based practice that uses music to accomplish individualized goals and objectives. And so essentially, uh, we're using different aspects of music to achieve individualized goals. And that's both in and outside of sessions. So, you know, we're seeing progress, both when we're there with the client, and then the hope is, can we translate that outside you know of our session time and one of the things that i love about music therapy is how personalized we can design a session depending on who's sitting in front of us and we do this in a lot of different ways uh you know we of course start with an assessment so we assess the strengths and the needs of each client and their interests and you know what they want to get out of therapy if it's a family member who's coming to us for services same thing you know we're getting their history and and what they're looking for and then we provide treatment and that can include doing, you know, creating music together, singing, moving, listening to music, songwriting, lyric analysis. Uh, the possibilities are really endless. It just kind of depends on who's in front of us. And uh, we focus on social, emotional, cognitive, physical communication, musical and spiritual needs. So we don't necessarily focus on all of them with every client. But again, it goes back to their needs and interests and what's going to benefit the client the most. Well, that's a real wide variety. You know, yeah. I think so many of us, we just think of music and we like it or we hate it, you know, mm -hmm, it's, it's mm -hmm. leave it on the channel or change it. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Type thing. And, and I think people don't understand how music really affects our moods. Mm -hmm. And I, I was amazed. I know my mom had um, a music therapist uh, come in and then just some musicians come in too. And how they could swing her moods was just incredible and, and elevate them. Yeah, it was really, really fun to see uh, with all of that. So, you know, for the benefits for for the older adults, can you give us some examples of those? Sure. Yeah. So there are lots of benefits and, you know, talking about mood, that's, you know, that's a huge one. So we can even just start there, but supporting positive mood and emotional states. So mm -hmm. uh, when we're thinking about that, you know, I've been called in before I worked, I've kind of worked in lots of different uh, um, communities in different ways. So I'm in private practice now where I go in and then I leave. But at one point I was a full-time music therapist in long-term care. And so what's really great about having a full-time music therapist on staff is you can call them 
in a moment of crisis, mm -hmm. right? And you can still do that when we work with hospice and we work with social workers, you know, if an individual's having a crisis, we can still go. But mm -hmm. if you're there in the community or in the facility, obviously it's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I was called for this moment of crisis for a client that I saw individually and they weren't entirely sure what, um, kind of triggered or the, you know, his agitation, but all of a sudden he was incredibly agitated. He mm -hmm. was, he was in crisis. His fists were clenched. His, his facial muscles were tense. You know, he was kind of holding, um, there was like a, a bar on the side of, you know, one of the walkways that he was holding on to, and he was in a wheelchair and he was just distraught. And so they asked, you know, can you do something? You know, we've tried everything. And so I sat with my guitar. Uh, I knew, you know, what music he enjoyed. He was huge John Denver, big in country music. Uh, that was kind of his thing. And, you know, uh, in music therapy, we have something called an ISO principle, which is matching someone's individual where they're at. So you would start music that is kind of more intense or louder or faster. You know, you kind of match where his mood is. And then the idea is to bring it to that ideal place. And so mm -hmm. in, in this regard, I just wanted to give him some peace, you know, mm -hmm. and what that looked like kind of changed throughout our time together. But, you know, I was able to share different songs with him and change, you know, how fast I was playing something, how loud I was playing something. And that's when, you know, uh, recorded music is wonderful, but a music therapist being able to change dynamics and tempo and, and key changes if needed, you know, um, that's where all of our training comes in. And so by probably 15 to 20 minutes of this, eventually his facial mus muscles started to relax. He was no longer clenching his fists, you know, and by the time I left, I want to say there maybe 30 minutes had passed. He was asleep, you know, he, he was, his eyes were closed. He was relaxed. And then they were able, you know, I believe it was something care related, uh, but, you know, so they were able to then check on him and, and do what they needed to do, the nursing staff. So that's just a great example when it when you know talking about what you're saying you know mm -hmm. and it could be something where you're in crisis or it could just be you know an individual is maybe just having a tough day maybe it's not something specific or they're not acting out but they're just kind of down and out and music mm -hmm. can pick us up uh creating positive engagement and stronger self-esteem and identity uh this is a big one i'm currently seeing a client individually who's a music educator. Mm -hmm. And so he is a professional musician as well. And on his prof on his uh, principal instrument, he no longer can play to the ability he used to. And he's very mm -hmm. aware of that. And so that's something to keep in mind too, that sometimes that can be so frustrating, especially if they were a musician, that we want to see, okay, how can we still make music meaningful? And so we don't work with that instrument, but he has so much knowledge in music theory and, and you know, able to play by ear. And so I have an instrument called an auto harp. It's a folk instrument and it's got a lot of strings, but you press a button and that's the, the chord it plays. So you press C, it plays a C chord. And so he can play by ear, I'll sing down in the valley, or mm -hmm. I'll sing You Are My Sunshine, or we're in Austin, Waltz across Texas. <laughs> uh, and he's able to do those chord changes. I'll tell him the key, we'll play through the chords, and then we'll create music together. Mm -hmm. So that looks very different for an individual who has a music background. But mm -hmm. I also want to share, you don't need uh, formal training in music to receive the benefits of music therapy. So, you know, again, going back to that individualized uh, treatment, we meet the client where they're at and then kind of decide what we do in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, another big one is for helping with feelings of isolation and loneliness. And I think we all experienced this during COVID, uh, but this was something in long-term care and with older adults that was it being experienced, you know, we were seeing it long before COVID, but yep. I think it shined a light, I think, because all of us were experiencing it. So then we could identify, you know, a lot of folks who who weren't in long term care could then identify, oh, if I'm feeling this way in my home. You know, what does this individual who's in an unfamiliar place or who isn't seeing their family and friends? Mm -hmm. And so music is a great way to bridge that gap. And again, that can look a lot of different ways too. So sometimes it's working with someone individually, 
maybe they used to be very social and they mm -hmm. used to be out and about and maybe they had a fall maybe um they had a just a decline maybe their disease is progressing and they're kind of aware mm -hmm. uh that they can't keep up in conversation or that sort of a thing and so maybe they used to kind of be this social butterfly and now mm -hmm. they're they're retreating to their room more and more mm -hmm. so individually i could start working with them and sharing music individually and then slowly can we invite one of their friends to join us for music in their room, in their space? Mm -hmm. And then can we transfer that? Oh, you know, your friends, Joe and Mary, they're just sitting in the common area there. Do you want to come out and join? So again, it's working on goals and objectives. You know, what is our goal for this client? Is it something to get, you know, we'll say Beth, is it is it trying to get Beth to socialize again? And if that's it, if it's trying to get her reconnected because that's important to her, you know, how can we do that through music? So that's kind of another example uh, with that. Well, those are all, all great. Um, I just remember, you know, for us as a family, we didn't understand the power of music. You know, my mom was always in the choir at church and, and, you know, she loved to sing and she always liked music, but we never, we never thought of it as a tool to mm -hmm. be able to be used. And um, after we had, you know, somebody come out and work with her, you know, we realized, well, we could do some things ourselves to improve her yeah. quality of life. We could never do what you guys do. Mm -hmm. um, but we could, we were much more conscious of music. And I think it's so, it's something that we just all take for granted mm -hmm. out there. And we don't really look at how powerful it is. I mean, I know I can be driving in the car and I can start sobbing because a yeah. song triggers me <laughs> or I can just be in a good mood and the memories are rolling, you know, back when I was in high school mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And, and, you know, all of those things still exist no matter what age we are mm -hmm. um, because they're just tied to such strong emotions and, Emotions are a lot of times one of the last things that leave, especially with a person with dementia. They might not know why they have those emotions or what's mm -hmm. triggering them anymore, but you know they're there, and yeah. um, there's different ways to deal with them. But I was, I was surprised how you know you could bring my mom kind of out of a dead sleep, and mm -hmm. just full of joy, you know, and her hands are going and her toes are going yeah. and she's smiling and giggling and laughing and trying to remember as many of the words that she could. She knew the, she knew the rhythm, but mm -hmm. she, you know, she kind of lost her words, you know, there towards the end and stuff, but it was, those are just such powerful moments. And I think it really makes families look at what's possible because, you know, we have people who tell us, oh, you don't need to go see them anymore because they don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. But when you see that, you know, there's a lot more going on within them. Yeah. And I, I always say, you know, in a lot of trainings and education that I do for caregivers and professionals is focusing on a loved one's abilities, what they're still yeah. able to do. And as you're saying, music can bring out a lot of their strengths. You know, I get to see the best in folks a lot of times when I'm working with them musically and you know, music is centered throughout our brain. So it's not mm -hmm. just in one area. And so going back to how emotions is one of the last thing, you know, music is the same way. It's one of the first things we can connect to in the womb. And it's one of the last things as we're making that transition that we're still able to connect to. Uh, and it's also something a lot of times, you know, I'll sometimes get referrals or people will reach out when they've tried everything. And they're like, I, I want my loved one or my client to be engaged, but I don't, nothing is working or nothing is clicking or they're not interested in much. And a lot of times music can be beneficial. You know, it's non-pharmological and it can be a great resource. And like you said, a great tool. And, you know, you can't practice music therapy, but again, uh, a lot of the training and the education that I give is talking to folks about how can you use music in a meaningful way. Yeah. And like you said, there's so much that you can do as a caregiver, as a professional, uh, that can go a long way with that individual. And then of course, calling in a music therapist as well. But yeah, I remember, you know, we, we learned different tools as a family, like my 
in, in terms of engagement, especially with my mom towards her end stages. My daughter would always like paint her nails because that's a oh, really yeah. intimate thing to do. Mm-hmm. I would always have my bottle of lotion and my brothers weren't touchy and feely, but they could push a CD player, you know, mm-hmm. and, and back then that's what we had was a CD yeah. player, you know, <laughs> they, they, they could put on Frank Sinatra for her and she would, she would light up. And mm-hmm. the, the other comment I wanted to make too, was you had mentioned, you know, from womb you know babies hear that music they can recognize it once they're out but a lot of times I think people don't take it to the the other end of the extreme when it's end of life or someone's kind of comatose they're still taking all that stuff in Mm -hmm. and I think I I personally have witnessed where that has brought some peace and comfort yeah Um, and I know hospice uses music therapists a lot yeah yeah I have um not worked for hospice directly, but when Mm -hmm. I was full-time in long-term care, the hospice that came in, we Mm -hmm. worked pretty closely and I got referrals that way. I've also worked with folks who are living with dementia who are transitioning into end of life. So they're an individual client who I've seen many years. Mm -hmm. So I've seen them through the different moments in their journey. Uh, And so that can be really powerful. And again, if you have a music therapist who's on board, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can bring us in at the end But if we're there before that, then we have all of that knowledge, all of that rapport with that client, all of their musical preferences at our disposal that we can use in those final moments or in those final days or, you know, whatever the case may be. I had one individual who was in quite a lot of pain Mm -hmm. as she was starting to transition on hospice and, uh, you know, I would come in for that hour and it was the only time she wasn't calling out, you know, it was the only time that she had this relief. And so I worked with the nursing staff, you know, she had a CD player. And so could we try recorded music? And it wasn't as beneficial, but there was some help there. So, you know, but I think part of it was too, she, I worked with her for years. She knows my voice, you know, she knows my voice. She may not be able to make eye contact with me anymore. She may not be able to vocalize or verbalize with me anymore, but there's a familiarity of who I am and, you know, the music I'm bringing. And yeah, that can be very powerful uh, on on the end stages as well as at the beginning of life. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when my mom was uh, in a nursing home and she was really struggling taking showers and Mm -hmm. she would get kind of combative. And, you know, I went into the executive director and I had talked with Tipa Snow and she said, you know, use a handheld shower head that's a rain shower head, start at the feet and, you know, explain that, you know, fat pads and stuff had um, disintegrated. So the nerves were closer to the top. Mm. And so when I went into the director, I, I, you know, I donated a bunch of shower heads and then he's like, oh, we're redoing the bathrooms. What else do you want? And I kind of went through this whole thing and he says, anything else? And I said, I said, well, I think one of the most powerful things would be is if you could get your staff to sing in the showers <laughs> with people, yeah. put on their music, because uh-huh. that just calms them down. And again, we could never do it how you guys would do it, but it just brings, it, you know, it distracts and brings fun and mm-hmm. it's, you know, music's engaging. Yeah. You know, and you're, you're part of something else. And, and so I just thought I'd throw that in there because that no, was definitely I've, and I've worked with individual showering, you know, I've also been, I was an activities director mm-hmm. when I first, you know, was finding a job in the field and bathing and showering and all of that is so difficult for so many for the reasons you mentioned for lots of other reasons, mm-hmm. you know, you, who, gets naked in front of people they don't know you know like that that alone is can be very daunting and everything you said setting up the environment you know is so important and music can be a great part of that you can even start music before you go into the shower into the bathroom Mm -hmm. you know and that and i always say too because sometimes caregivers or professionals you know they're uncomfortable singing they don't like the sound of their voice now yeah yeah and that's totally fine (laughs) yeah Yeah, but now you know we have it at our disposal on our phones you know Mm -hmm. now you know instead of carting around a record player a cd player cassette player you know so can you just put a couple songs on a playlist and have that in your pocket and play it and so you're walking with that individual and maybe you're humming or you're singing if you're comfortable they're singing and then you're bringing them into the room and i know tipa talks a lot about this you know making sure that the temperature in the room you know in the bathroom is right that the water temperature but also the air temperature 
you know, and the lighting, you know, set you're setting the mood essentially yep. to make it and setting it so they can be successful and you can be successful in helping them. And that's one thing with music and ADLs in general and activities of daily living. And I do that with education and training as well is, you know, you can implement music in ways that can really help ease the process with ADL care. Yeah, because we don't we don't look at it like a tool, like in the shower, you know, you just yeah, have exactly. A, you don't think about it. A yeah. heated towel bar or even diffusing oils, mm -hmm. you know, can be really nice and complimentary. Yeah. All those different things, but we, you know, we're looking at the black and white things. You know, mm -hmm. do we have a shower chair? Do we, you know? But we, yeah, you know, we talk about process and stuff, but it is really about setting the mood and making people feel comfortable with it. I do want to mention if people are just tuning in, we are talking with Tara Jenkins with Harmony in Dementia. She's a music therapist. Uh, you can visit her at her website, harmonyindementia.com, or you can email her at contact harmony in dementia.com. She's also on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn at Harmony in Dementia. We've just been having a great conversation. So if you missed the first half, reel back, you're <laughs> going to want to hear it. But let's go ahead and, and continue here. Yeah. Um, I, I'm always curious about people's business names. Why mm -hmm. did you why did you pick Harmony in Dementia? Yeah, so um, I was in private practice in the DC area years ago and then i moved out here to austin six or seven years was working with a company and so when i decided to go back into private practice i was really trying to think you know i'm providing music therapy services but i also want to provide a lot of support to caregivers and professionals i'm very passionate about that as well as we've already been talking mm -hmm. and so i started to think you know when you create harmony in a group whether it's singers or instrumentalists you need different notes to produce that chord mm -hmm. to create that chord and you can't do it alone and that's the same with individuals living with dementia and those who are caring for them mm -hmm. and supporting with them. You know, it takes a village, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a support system or along the way they start building a support system. Some folks, yep. they start just them and their loved one. And I think that support system is so important for the individual living with dementia, but also the caregiver. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that caregiver is all of their needs, their wants, their health, everything, you know, I know I don't have to speak to that to you being a caregiver yourself, but you know, that all gets pushed aside. And that's also mm -hmm. so important, you know, especially um, with an individual living with dementia, you know, they could live with their disease for 10 years, 20 years, you know, so it's not always a short term thing. Yeah, and my so, mom was 30 years. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you can't do it alone. And it does take a team of people. And so for me, that's kind of what I wanted to convey with harmony and dementia is I am providing music services, but it really is much more than that. It's how mm -hmm can you, can we be together in harmony mm -hmm. when we're working with folks, when we're caring for folks with dementia, but then also for ourselves as well. You know, I, I do um, training and education. I've got something, I think it's Thursday, this a little bit later this week, but it's with um, a company who wanted to provide support for their caregivers. Their caregivers mm -hmm. come for resources and we're doing music and self-care. So that's like another big area where a lot of times we focus on, okay, what are our loved ones musical preferences mm -hmm. and what do they enjoy? And that's all very beneficial. But I also uh, encourage caregivers, write down your musical preferences, write down, you know, what you like to do as far as self care and things like that, not only for if you know, you have a short hospital stay or mm -hmm. something happens crisis, but it also might be a way a lot of times friends and family reach out and they say, how can we help? And a lot of times we're not sure, or sometimes it's, I need time or I need space, but you know, you could say, I love John Denver and we've got a record player. Like, do you have any John Denver record? You know, it could yep. be something like that where you're reaching out musically uh, for yourself as well as for your loved ones. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where uh, the name kind of that focus came from and my business in general, my private practice, it's from the curiosity and passion that started with my grandmother. You know, I'd make these connections, but I wasn't sure why they were being made and why, you know, why could she recognize me sometimes and not others? And, and, you know, and so it started there and then it just grew the more education and the more knowledge I had both mm -hmm. 
in dementia specific and then also music therapy it's for me it's meaningfully connecting with others that's that's kind of the big takeaway how can i meaningfully connect uh with folks through music whether it's education and training music therapy services consult you know consults you know basically no matter how i'm interacting i want to do that in a meaningful way well and you know i love i love your explanation and to me harmony means peaceful and joyful and who yeah. doesn't want that and a lot of times mm -hmm. people dealing with dementia don't think that's even possible you know yeah, yeah. This calmness at times and then when you talked about you know it's blended it really is kind of that team effort in and not forgetting about yourself. Mm -hmm. I think I, I know I forgot about myself and um, yeah, which is understandable and easy to do, right? Real, like, <laughs> real easy to do, but yeah. really detrimental for yourself and for the person you're caring for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they can, you know, it just as easily, like you say, make that playlist and realize what's good for dementia is good for them too. Yeah they can take advantage of that mm -hmm. and you know they can have that playing in the in the background maybe when they didn't think they really needed it and now mm -hmm. they know it's a tool that'll help calm them down you know yeah. give them some peace and stuff so i i think that's really important can you explain i know you you um deliver a lot of different types of services mm -hmm. and you touched on some of them but let's just go through each of them individually yeah. with the people so I provide music therapy services, which we've talked a lot about, mm -hmm. and I provide both group and individual services. Mm -hmm. So group services are a lot more in a community setting. Uh -huh. uh, and so when I'm doing those types of services, I'm bringing singing, moving, listening, and playing activities. So mm -hmm. lots of different instruments, percussion, recorded music, live music. Um, you know, one thing I say is as a music therapist, I sing and I play guitar, but sometimes, you know, you mentioned Frank Sinatra for your mm -hmm. mom. I'm never going to sound like Frank Sinatra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, sometimes hearing that voice will trigger a different memory or a connection. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll make, it'll make those neurons will fire and connect mm -hmm. uh, in a way that maybe they wouldn't if I was singing it. So mm -hmm. I do think recorded music plays an important role when working with folks living with dementia. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm always sure to incorporate at least one or two recorded songs when I'm working with groups and individuals. Mm -hmm. And so group services can look a lot of different ways, but a lot of times it's really about connecting people individuals to each other. So peers, mm -hmm. you know, making those peer relationships. So it's yep. a lot of social goals, uh, but it's also reminiscent discussion. So encouraging mm -hmm. reminiscence and building upon that, sharing memories, uh, getting folks to move, mm -hmm. you know, talking about music as a motivator for exercise. Yep. You know, we do movement in all of my groups uh, and it's movements that I know that are safe and easy for folks, movements that um, you know, I've worked with PTs in the past and things like that. And so we're doing a lot of different things in a group setting. And then in an individual setting, I kind of gave some examples earlier, but there I can tailor a program and treatment even more so than in a group setting, because in a group setting, I'm going to have folks who are in their 50s, their 80s, you know, their 60s, you know, I might have lots mm -hmm. of different ages. And so I always make sure I've got music that's going to hit all of those different age groups within one session. Mm -hmm. But with an individual, if they love disco, that's where mm -hmm. we're going to live, you know, we're mm -hmm. going to use other styles of music. Mm -hmm. But if that's what really motivates them, then that's where we're going to start, we're going to start with their preferred music. And then again, it's just figuring out, you know, what are within assessment, what are our goals and objectives, and then tailoring that plan to them. Uh, but I also provide music workshops, education and training. And so that can be webinars, uh, interviews like this, you know, mm -hmm. where I'm kind of talking with folks, trainings for staff on how to use music in the community. So mm -hmm. ways that like we were talking with ADLs, the same with caregivers, you know, how they can also discover music preferences. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do if your loved one can no longer tell you. And, you know, not all family members, uh, know their loved one's music preferences. Yeah. If music wasn't prominent in the home growing up, then they might not have anything to think back to as what their loved one enjoys. And so there's lots of different ways that you can discover preferences. So, um, you know, I can t I talk about that in trainings and things like that. And then consultation services that can be for a community. So if an activity director has volunteers and they want them to use music in a meaningful way, 
a while back, uh, you had us on for Music, Memory and Meaning, which was mm -hmm. a book that I co-authored. And so that would be a great way to do a consultation with that activity director and say, hey, you can use this book, you can give it to your volunteers, mm -hmm. you know, I can do a training with the volunteers, I can consult with you, you know, and we, we talk about building a, a volunteer music program, but it mm -hmm. could also be consulting with a caregiver. So it could be maybe one 30 minute consult, or it could be frequent, maybe we meet monthly, and someone's caring for their loved one in the home, and they're like, okay, like we said, bathing is really difficult. How can music help? Or this is what's currently going on. You know, do I need more than what I'm providing? And can a music therapist help? You know, you know, who do I need to reach out to? And all of these services are, I offer them virtually and in person. And virtually when it comes to music therapy services, that really depends on the individual and it depends on where they're at uh, with their with their disease and 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 kind of we decide is it beneficial you know for them to receive services virtually and if it's not then I would refer out uh, I've you know I'm connected to folks throughout the country um, in other countries as well so you know I'm able to say hey I have this client they're in need of music therapy is there someone in person mm -hmm. and virtual services you know in COVID. <laughs> Obviously, we were all trying to do everything we could, but I actually was on Skype uh, long before COVID with an individual. I lived in Maryland in private practice, and then I moved here, and it was a husband and wife, and they wanted to continue services. Their son was very involved in their care, and we we were like, let's just try Skype. And at that point, nobody was really doing it. Like it it was kind of happening with traditional, you know, psychotherapy, but even then it wasn't as frequent and we did it and it worked and they benefited from it. And we did it through COVID and uh, through both of them transitioning and, and passing away. So, you know, it can be very beneficial for folks, but again, it really just depends on what you're looking for and how that individual responds when mm -hmm. it's virtual or telehealth. Well, yeah, and, and I totally get that, totally yeah. understand that, um, because some people have a real hard time paying attention or mm -hmm. maneuvering, you know, the yeah. technology, um, getting bored, all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. What do you love most about your, your job? Because, you know, when you're talking, it seems like there's not an area that you just aren't yeah. exuberant about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could talk for hours <laughs> about it. And it's always a hard thing to narrow down when someone asks me that. But for me, it goes back to those meaningful connections, mm -hmm. you know, and those connections made through music. And I get to see folks on so many different parts of their journey, you know, from beginning to middle to end stages and everywhere in between and being able to witness and help foster those connections that they can make with themselves that can bring back a specific memory or moment or with their family members like we were saying you know a lot of times family um, who aren't the primary caregiver they don't know how to interact with that loved one anymore that goes for yeah. grandchildren children adult children you know it doesn't matter your age it's if you're not used to being around folks with dementia it can be uncomfortable and also frustrating because they might not be the person that you you knew of mm -hmm. and so music can really bridge that gap so i love being able to provide that support and and having them have a, a a meaningful visit you know and a way that they can that they can take that memory you know instead of the memories when their loved one is frustrated or confused and there's gonna those memories are going to be there too uh but can can music help facilitate some positive interactions as well uh I love seeing when, uh, like you were saying, with going back to your mom, you know, hearing a song that maybe they haven't heard in 20 years and all of a sudden they know the chorus or they know the rhythm or their face lights up. Maybe they're not singing, but you can tell that that song holds a special place for them or has a special connection. And uh, I go back to a clinical story in my internship that still stays with me today. Um, it was in a woman who was living with MS, but was noticing she was living full time in a community, but was recognizing that uh, her memories were leaving her. She was she was very aware that she wasn't able to work. Her recall was not as strong, but her recall with music was 
it's, to this day, it's one of the most impressive. She could hear any song and have a very detailed memory associated with it. That the music, and sometimes it was a song that, you know, it it wasn't what the lyrics were saying. It's because it's where she was when she heard it. You know, she heard When the Saints, and this is, you know, 17 years ago. And she was like, oh, that song, we used to go to the canteen and it was a place where young people hung out. And I went with my boyfriend and we played on the jukebox and we danced, you know? And so she had so many of these memories. So we put together kind of a life review. So, you know, it was all in her words and it would be the song title and it would be what her memories were associated with it. And then I was able to, you know, when my six months was done and she was transitioning to a different therapist, uh, you know, uh, I was able to leave that with her. So it was something that when folks visit it, they could read through it. They could also share those memories with her. So if, you know, she could no longer recall it, Bicycle Built for Two was another big one for her. You know, some of these songs that now I'm not sharing <laughs> quite as much, but you know, again, this was 17 years ago, but she, it was, it was just, it was so impressive. You know, she White Christmas was another big one. And she loved when Bing and Danny Kay dressed like Rosemary Clooney when they sang Sisters. So that was one that she had memories of her sisters and would always make her laugh when she heard that song. So yeah, for me, it's all about those connections. And that's, you know, what stays with me, whether I had a client 17 years ago or saw them two days ago, it's a lot that I carry with me. And then, you know, there are tools in my toolbox as I go to treat other folks as well. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because all the songs you brought up were, were songs my mom loved, you know. Yeah. She's been gone since 2014. Um, but she would just light up, just absolutely light up, you know, when she would hear some of those songs. And, uh, but one of the things I wanted to ask you, because a lot of times people will like scold a care partner mm -hmm. if they are singing uh, like an old lullaby. That's yeah. childish. You shouldn't be doing that. What are your thoughts on that? So for me, it comes to the meaning behind it. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing. Um, calling someone by a nickname like mm -hmm. sweetie or honey. Yep. I think it all depends on what the intention, the meaning, and if that individual, maybe their nickname was honey, maybe that's what everyone knows them by, then that's very different, right? Yep. And kind of the same with music. You know, there's a lot of research that the music from our late teens, early 20s is the music that's going to stay with us the longest and that we're going to be connected with. But I always say try and experiment. You know, there's nothing wrong with, and sharing new music is activating your brain in a different way. You know, it's so, so there's, there's positives to that. But when you think of a lullaby, like you are my sunshine, that's mm -hmm. one <laughs> that I feel like people think of a lot. Um, for me, it goes back to intention. You know, I had an individual who their mother sang that for them. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a very comforting lullaby to have. So mm -hmm. the meaning was there. So it was important to share that song. And so I think like with anything else, you know, if the intention and the meaning is there and I, I always, it always breaks my heart when someone scold it, <laughs> mm -hmm. trying their best to use music. Again, I think there's a different way to go about it. You know, um, I don't know that I'd share row, row your boat, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that, that, connects me more to a younger song. However, if it's someone who they live by the water, they had a rowboat, they, you know, again, like if the meaning and intention matches up and it's a song that they're connecting with and they're singing and they're yeah. getting benefits out of it, then I might reconsider that, you yeah. know? So I, th I think it all goes back to intention and meaning, but yeah, I, I'm of the belief especially if you're caring for someone in the home uh, or if you're a caregiver, a professional caregiver out there, you know, a lot of times we're being a detective with mm -hmm. dementia and, and that's in, in my job as well as a music therapist. You know, if I don't know someone's music preferences, I have to start somewhere. So yep. starting with their age and then figuring out okay they you know this time period they were 1960s so mm -hmm. maybe that's where i'm going to start but i'm also going to bring in music from other decades i'm going to bring in other styles because again if it's parent if it's songs your parents sang to you or whoever took care of you as a child then we might still be sharing sentimental journey i yep. the, i have a client now who his mother loved doris day 
sang mm-hmm. it in the house. And so that's a song we always close with because it's very meaningful to him. And it's one that he loves and reminds him of his mother. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to deprive him of that because it doesn't match up with what he should be listening to. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. What people think, you know, or like when you mentioned row, row, row your boat, I'm thinking he could, it could tie into Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or exactly. something like that. Yeah. You yeah. Know, fun time or the old church songs that, mm-hmm. you know, were really for little kids, but it was something that was just part of their life. Um, yeah. And when you mentioned you are my sunshine, that was one of my mom's favorites. In fact, mm-hmm. we sang that um, at her, at her wake, at her funeral, at her, at her celebration. And, and, and everybody joined in singing yeah. and, walked, and, and everybody walked out on a real high note and mm-hmm. said, boy, we really got to know your mom, you know, during yeah. the process and stuff. And it wasn't, but I remember being scolded and, and I, yeah. I remember telling one person, don't you dare, you don't yeah. know what brings my mom joy. Well, and that's the other thing too, is, you know, I always say that to caregivers, like, you know, your loved one, the best, especially mm-hmm. if you're the primary caregiver, if you're the primary caregiver, at the end of the day, you're making the decisions that you think is best. Mm-hmm. And that can look a lot of different ways. And a lot of people are going to have a lot of opinions. <laughs> Just like they do on everything else. Exactly. And <laughs> yep. so, you know, and it's it's really hard to navigate that. But I think, you know, if you know what brings her joy or if mm-hmm. you can see that in the moment, um, and I give you credit for standing up because a lot of people say, oh, I guess I shouldn't do that. And rightfully so, like, yep. like you don't want to be that doesn't make you feel good to be told that and then you think oh am i doing my mother my loved one a disservice did i yeah. do something wrong am i causing harm um and that's something i always like to bring up too you know we talk about all these positive interactions mm-hmm. with music but music cuz it's so deeply connected with emotions can bring up a lot of different types of emotions and so you know I always say in my groups, you know, you're in a safe space, you know, Mm -hmm. if you, you know, if somebody is teary eyed, or Mm -hmm. is upset, you know, it's okay to cry sometimes, you know, a caregiver might say somebody, you know, like a private duty aide or a CNA might say, Oh, you know, they don't want to see them upset. And so they mean well. And for me, it's okay that they're upset. And Mm -hmm. as a music therapist, I can process that verbally non verbally with Mm -hmm. the music. Um, But it's always something I like to share when caregivers are listening to be aware that those Mm -hmm. emotions might come up and your loved one might not be able to tell you why. But if you can be there with them, you know, and maybe you hold their hand or maybe you give them a tissue, you know, you show that support and that emotion. And then, of course, if that tearfulness and, you know, that that upset, or if there are certain reactions become consistent, then that's when I would say, reach out to whoever your support team is, reach out to a music therapist, social worker, doctor, you know, um, and see if there's something else going on there. But uh, music can bring back all of those emotions and that's okay. It's more about how we help support our loved one to navigate that. And that's when that becomes tricky if you don't have the training and the expertise. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm glad that you brought that up because it is all kinds of emotions. I yeah. mean, it'd be, um, I, I've seen people be triggered by taps because they mm-hmm. didn't have a good experience yeah. in service yeah. or they, you know, it was a real traumatic, you know, situation where maybe they, they lost a lot of men and it triggers, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it, it can be all kinds of stuff. It can be all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, I had, um, Oh, I can't remember the song now, but it was a song about water. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was a a folk song, The Water is Wide. It was Mm -hmm. just a very traditional folk song. And the woman had an experience with someone who had drowned, Mm -hmm. you know, so something that you wouldn't, I wouldn't have ever connected with Mm -hmm. that. And she, it was in a group and she got very upset and she was able to communicate that to me. And so when that happens in a group setting, I really gauge it. If someone can communicate to me why they're upset, I ask right away, do we need to switch songs? You know, and if they say yes, then we're going to switch songs and I'll share with the group, you know, sometimes it brings up feelings and and we don't want to hear it. But most times people are okay with sharing the song. They want to grieve. They want to share that emotion. Um, And now if they can't verbally tell me, I'll go over to them. I'll hand them a tissue, especially in a group setting, in an individual session, it's going to look a lot different, but in a group, you know, I'll go over and I'll encourage the group to keep going. If we're playing to a song or singing Mm -hmm. or whatever we're doing, 
Um, and I'll kind of check in with that individual and, and see where they're at. And if it feels like we can keep going, we will. If it feels like we need to change gears and change songs, we'll do that. And we've had a lot of beneficial discussions that come out of that about talking about our emotions, you know, and again, depending on the group and who's there. Um, sometimes, you know, in an assistant living group, it was a song, All I Have to Do is Dream by the Everly Brothers. And the husband started to share that his wife, you know, everyone in that group knows that his wife has dementia and is in the dementia uh, building of that, mm. you know, care community. Yep. Uh, and others have loved ones in there as well. And so, you know, he felt comfortable sharing. It was a safe space. Mm. He knew those folks and shared, you know, it reminds me of my wife. And, you know, the other day I saw her and she didn't remember me. And th that was really hard. But this song is bringing me joy, but it's bringing me sadness, you know, because that's the other thing most times the song isn't going to just bring us one emotion mm -hmm. you know it's not going to connect us to to one emotion or sometimes it connects us to one moment you know but it's also a song that they dance to so for him a lot of emotions were coming up and we were able to process that together and we were able to talk about it and share music and then others were able to share their stories that helped him and then it really became this beautiful support system with Mm -hmm. his peers and with folks who were there with him you know every day so so yeah i for me again it, it goes back to you know i want to make sure that individual feels safe i want to make sure that they feel cared for that they feel heard a lot of times too in dementia a lot of folks don't feel heard so if i can make them feel heard however whatever that looks like uh through music i want to do my best to mm -hmm. do that well, this has just been a great conversation. So thank you yeah. for taking the time with us today. I, I always learn so much um, on each and every interview. And I just think music therapy is so important for people to really understand. And you defined it well. You gave us great examples of, you know, how to bring joy and comfort, not only to the person with dementia, but, but all of us in general, you know, how, mm -hmm. we, can, how we can leverage that. So for our listeners... I hope you like, click and share, be a giver of hope. You know, there's people in your sphere that you don't know are struggling. And uh, there's so much great information that, that Tara Jenkins gave us today. Again, her company is called Harmony in Dementia. And you can visit her website, harmonyindementia.com, or you can uh, email her by contact at Harmony in Dementia. And then uh, you can always find her on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, again, as Harmony in Dementia. Again, wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you so much for sharing and teaching us, you know, more about music therapy, um, all the different types of services that you offer and, and how, how we can leverage that to care better, not only for someone else, but for ourselves as well. So yeah, yeah, you're you. welcome. Thank you for having me. And like I said, I can talk for hours. So I appreciate <laughs> the time. <laughs> oh, no, you did, did wonderful. Thank you. Um, in closing, I'll just uh, ask people also to check out alzheimerspeaks.com. We have all kinds of free resources there. Till next time. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.